Hi, this is Paul. Every week, John Verveke, who is a professor of cognitive science and psychology at the University of Toronto, puts out a new video in his series. It's going to be a 50-episode series called Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. Now, before this, he had done a series, Buddhism and Cognitive Science, and the sound quality of that wasn't very good. And so some students have worked with him to create this, this new format. Uh, just in fact, in episode 16, the lighting was a little bit better, so you could see him a little bit better. So I've been following this very closely. Now, episode 15 and 16, he began, didn't really, not the first times he's talked about Christianity, but he um, touched on it very directly. And so a number of people wrote to me and said, oh, have you seen this? Are you going to comment on it? And I am going to comment on it, and I'm going to integrate it into the other conversations and things that I've been following. I've been I've been following this course very closely. I've learned a tremendous amount from it. Now, a number of people have said to me things like, well, I don't know if I want to watch Verveke because he talks about Buddhism. And I'm going to talk about those labels a little bit. The course really isn't about Buddhism. The course is about the meaning crisis, uh, the history of philosophy, cognitive science, and so I haven't found this. He's also a, um, John Verveke is a physicalist. He's, uh, he uses Buddhism and some Eastern practices for some things in his life. He's not a Christian, but I think there is a lot that can be learned from this course of study. If you decided you only were going to learn from Christians, that would limit the number of people that you can learn from. I think it's also important to remember that the Apostle Paul quotes uh, ancient, uh, I think it was probably a Stoic, um, ancient philosophy in the book of Acts in one of his sermons. So that there are, there's a lot to talk about with respect to those kinds of issues of how um, Christianity and our religious presuppositions reflect what we believe how we should interact with people and disciplines that are non-Christian. There's that, that's a that's a big issue. Uh, you know, we don't we don't demand that our geologists who dis, who find the location of the oil are Christians. We don't say this is Christian oil versus non-Christian oil. Um, whereas I my particular my. Uh, the physician that I, um, my physician is a Christian, and that's a lovely thing, but I would obviously go to a physician that isn't a Christian, and on and on and on and on. So those who aren't watching Verveke because he, because in particular his last course had Buddhism in the title, you're missing out on some things because he's a scientist, a psychologist, and he's, he's really exploring the territory of belief. And so I've been paying a lot of attention to this belief, transformations, and so for this video and an upcoming video that I'm already working on, I'm going to talk a lot about transformation, which in Christianity we call it conversion, um, becoming, becoming a new person. And so in these two videos, he talked about Christianity a lot, and so I'm going to want to treat it. But before I get into it, I, I, I wanted to talk about Verveke and his project, and, and, of course, Jordan Peterson, his conversation at Liberty University and how this holds together before I actually dive too much into what John Verveke has to say about Christianity and his take on it. It's important to understand the project of his video series. He's trying to address the meaning crisis. People are suffering from a lack of meaning in their lives. Uh, traditional religious philosophical worldviews afforded meaning to individuals and communities over time. And what we've seen that in the modern period and in the postmodern period, people are suffering. We find this in higher rates of suicide uh, across the board. These are um, these have been under um, these worldviews that have given people meaning. These these religions have been undercut and are asserted to be no longer scientifically justifiable or deliverable in a scientific or secular context. And, and this is exactly what John is addressing. And so what John is doing in this, and he's very open in the course, talks about it. This is, this is the purpose. Can we find resources in the past that are workable in the present to address this crisis? And so he's 
looking, he's walking through philosophy as it pertains to the meaning crisis and asking questions about what he calls psychotechnology and some other things that can help us discover meaning. Now, obviously, as a um, this should be supported by cognitive science, and so that's some of what he works in. And so obviously I, as a Christian minister, have some different takes on some of these things. But what I've found in his course is I've learned a tremendous amount about a whole number of things. And he's given me a language to, he's given me a language to identify and understand part of why Christianity and the church has been so successful in helping people with meeting up to and including the present day. For example, um, so why is he treating Christianity in this way? Well, this is part of his larger project, and you can't talk about the history of the world, in particular the history of the West, and not look at why Christianity succeeded as much as it did. Now, again, he's not a believer. He doesn't identify as a Christian, and he's very upfront about that. He's not pretending to offer a definitive word on it. He understands that once you start talking about Christianity, even amongst Christians, you're going to have a whole lot of debate about what is Christianity, what is it attempting to do, what is the worldview really about, and if you've been around churches or theological schools or theological conversations, you know, and just open the Bible and pick a passage, and you'll have a number of people debating it on a whole variety of levels, and he's aware of this. This, in fact, is part of the reason why there's a lot of disclaimers as he gets into this. He's, he's trying to address people who are not Christians and others who are Christians. He's trying to address the religion uh, respectfully. He's trying to speak with honesty about how he views it, the things that he finds that find that works or that agrees with him or that he finds cogent and other things which, which don't. And, and again, to discuss Christianity, it's just a monumental thing in terms of world history, in particular the history of the West. So it's a, and he's got to do this all within a couple of one hour lectures. So it's a, it's a big task. And so give him, you know, if he doesn't, if he doesn't say the words you want him to say, be a little gentle. Because, again, between Christians, we don't say the words we want each other to say. Even just identifying as a Calvinist on my channel has unleashed whole, you know, many comments about, you know, why Calvinism is right or why Calvinism is wrong. And, and even what is Calvinism, a number of people look at my videos and say, well, you're not a real Calvinist. And so that's just a tiny little segment of Christianity. This, this is a big, big thing, and it's terribly hard to talk about. He's trying to understand it within the context of his project. So he's not trying to sum up all of Christianity. He's trying to see where it's germane, where it's relevant to what he's trying to do. Your question might be, if you are a Christian, can Christian benef Christians benefit from these insights? If you're not a Christian, you might have the same question. Can you as a non-Christian benefit from these insights? I think you can. I actually found the content of his last two videos very informative, and in fact, I thought he gave me more insight into Christianity and the gospel and the power of love. And and I thought, in fact, um, some of the language that he used and some of the insights that he used, um, I'm not only a lying pastor, I'm a thieving pastor. I'm going to steal some of this stuff. And some of you who pay attention to my church channel, which is on another line, and the my rough draft for Sunday sermons, notice that, well, Peterson and, and Verveke and the other things that I read and talk about, well, these things filter into my sermon. Of course they do. They're coming out of the same head. And the reason that I'm learning from these people is attempt to integrate and and work through basically the job of a pastor. I think I still have this book here. Um, John R. W. Stott. What is the what is preaching? Preaching in the twentieth century. The book's a little bit old. We're in the twenty first century, but it's between two worlds. And so what so what you try to do as a as a minister and as a preacher is is you try and connect. The, the world of the Bible, for example, with the present world. And Christians are doing that one way or another all the time. Now, limitations of using labels for safe spacing. Now, again, because John Verveke 
talks about Buddhism and uses Buddhist practice, however he would label himself. He calls himself a physicalist, which I think, frankly, is a better upgrade to materialist. And when he, for when I first heard him use that, I, I really cheered because I we're not really talking about materialism. We're talking about physicalism, and Verveke is dead on right about that. And so, but he's not a Christian, so should Christians listen to him? Well, I, again, there's a real problem with Christians deciding they're only going to listen to Christian, they're only going to listen to Christian music. They're only, only going to listen to Christians talk about things. Well, what about, about what things? Well, things? well, I'm only going to listen to Christians talk about spiritual things. Okay, what's in your category of spiritual? Is Oprah spiritual? Is Donald Trump spiritual? Is Was Barack Obama spiritual? So, you know, this is not as, as easy a thing as people imagine. By watching labels, you cannot just say, well, these are my Christian things or these are my non-Christian things. It, the, the world really doesn't work that way. There's an intersectionality of labels. You might open the door to someone because of their Christian label, but when they start talking politics, they voted for the wrong political party, suddenly you don't listen to them and you hate them. And you love your political allies, whether or not they're Christians, because you're working in a political sphere. And and so you people have this all the time, and I'm always amazed how, how often people are blind to it. Well, you know, I hate this person because they vote different than I do. Oh, but they're a Christian too. Well, I don't really think they're a Christian because they vote different than I do. And, you know, on and on we go with these. These labels are very intersectional. And so... They, they don't really work in terms of your ability to make your own little Christian safe space. Um, groups fight as fiercely within labels as religious silos. I, you know, you see this all the time because there's no bigger traitor than the traitor of the group as close to you as possible. You can see that in the Gospels where the Pharisees, in many ways, when you look at the Essenes, you look at the Zealots, you look at the aristocracy, the Pharisees were the religious political group that was closest to Jesus of any other group, and in many ways they hated him the most. And, and so you get antagonism between people who are very, very close. And you see this all the time in churches and religious debates. If you think Christians are fighting like cats and dogs against non-Christians, watch Christians fight against each other. This is simply a dynamic in human nature. And it makes this using labels for safe spacing pretty pretty pointless. There are implicit worldviews and cultural liturgies that pass outside the labels, especially in a cultural context. There's a lot um, there's a lot built into things without religious labels that form us and change us, especially over time. It's just how things work. If you use a car, one of my favorite portions of, of one of Peterson's classroom lectures when, was when he talks about talked about the implication of the automobile. What is the automobile? Well, it's a machine to get me from A to B. Or is it a thing that has completely altered the chemical atmosphere of planet Earth? Or is it a thing that has forced um, that has forced civic planning all over North America? Or is it, or is it, or is it? It's one thing has has multi-dimensional implications in ways we almost never think about. And so we just say, well, that's a Christian, I'll trust them. Well, okay, is there such a thing as a Christian car? Is there such a thing as a Christian house? What, what do we mean by Christian music? If they sing about Jesus, it's Christian music, and if they don't sing about Jesus, it's not Christian music? What goes into making a Christian movie? Now, when I went to Australia, the um, one of the people on staff of the church that we were doing the conference actually was a an alumni, an alumnus of Calvin College, which surprised me what she doing in Australia. But she said, Well well here's a here's a big, tall, loud, Dutch looking guy who's who's talking about culture and cultural integration and cultural discernment. That's exactly what Calvin College is about because Stuff is built into the culture, and so what we need to do is always the work of discernment. And if something has a label on it, if it has a religious label or a political label, or most often no label at all, meaning the, the presumed secular label, do discernment on it and, and figure out how you should respond to it, how you should engage with it.
So the process of discernment is continual. If you're looking for a Bible verse to justify this, look no further than um, the, the first epistle of John, chapter 4. Test the spirits to see if they are from God. Well, what on earth does that mean? Well, Christians should be doing that, frankly, all the time. And it can be handy that things have labels on them. It is handy when someone says, I am a Christian. Well, that is a very low resolution label on a person. And, well, it gets complicated from there. Well, what kind of a Christian are you? And what are these beliefs that you have as a Christian? And, and then, well, you have this belief or practice and you still call yourself a Christian? And these debates go everywhere. So, again, with respect to John Verveke and with respect to his the associations and labels that he tends to carry with respect to Buddhism, relax, listen to him, figure out what, just do the normal process of discernment on him. Now these labels came into full dramatic contrast when Jordan Peterson went to Liberty University, and I've done a couple of videos on this already. Jordan Peterson you know, very famously talks about Darwin all the time. If you go and look at Liberty University's faith statement, um, not big on Darwin. Uh, so what was Jordan Peterson doing at Liberty University? And as I mentioned before, what, what we saw was, in a sense, a, um, a competition, a vivid display of separated magisteria. Well, I put an L on there. I shouldn't have... Uh, that's what we saw there. And and what we're seeing is Peterson keeps saying, well, I talk as a psychologist, and David Nasser coming in and using symbolic religious language to make, make his assertion. So I'll play a little bit of that clip, and, and let's look at how these, these labels play out, and especially how the language plays out, and how transformation now, I'm going to use transformation. Christians, this is where we get into language, Christians might call it conversion. When Christians talk about conversion, they're talking about what now is more often used in secular parlance or in psychological parlance, a transformation. And, and pay attention here again with, with David Nasser and Jordan Peterson trying to find each other and, and figure out how we can talk about these things. So here's, here's Nasser's critique of Peterson and his 12 rules. I want to make sure we don't miss this moment. Dr. Peterson, we can give David your 12 books, 12 rules in that book. We can give him your next book, which is 12 more rules. And he can, they will be helpful to him. I, I gave your book to my daughter. They will be helpful to her. I read the books. I see Bible verses attached around them. But without David submitting, bending his knee to Christ and just saying, I don't want to clean up the behavior or deal with the symptoms. What's broken in me is my heart. Okay, right here. There's all this Christian language, okay? And I, I am not, when I'm labeling it that way, I am not dismissing it or demeaning it in any way. If you listen to my sermons, you'll hear me use it all the time. But that language is within a context. It's within, and we're going to use some verbaki terms, it's within an arena. And it has meaning within the arena. And and so what these two are trying to figure out, and I'm going to, in a little while I'm going to play a, a little bit from, from the uh, One Last Question video that they did, what we're grappling with here is is agency, and what we're beginning to ask the question, what transformations are we talking about? How do transformations take place? How can we participate in transformation of ourselves and others? How do we know when these transformations are positive? And and how does it relate to this language? When when David Nasser says bend the knee, he's he's saying he's saying, well, David Nasser, what he is doing is he's appropriating a a Christian use of language that has to do with the heart. Now, a few videos ago, ago I played a I played a clip from from Tim Keller when Tim Keller was talking about preaching to the heart. Now, why is David Nasser and Tim Keller both talking about the heart in this way? That's because Christians inhabit 
the the worldview and language of the Bible, and that's the language that the Bible uses. Now, it's important to remember that the Bible uses a lot of language, and over time, through theology and through culture, things get filtered down. And so in Christian circles, when we talk about the heart or a change of heart, Christians are using the heart as the symbol of the center of the person. When we get to, in fact, this is in our language all over the place, let's get to the heart of the matter. The heart is the center. It's the foundation. It's the essence. It's right there in the middle. And, and if you understand that and you listen to what David Nasser is saying, this is the language he's using. Now you can listen to his language and you can translate it into languages of other realms of other worldviews. You can translate it into a secular realm. A lot of what's happening with Peterson and Nasser here are they're, they're both doing a lot of translating in their heads. And when David Nasser looks at Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life, he's saying this they are trying to change the behaviors. We're trying to change the heart, which is the source of behavior, the seat of behavior, the center of the person. So let's, uh, let's, Let's go back a little bit. He does put things on. That... And again, pay attention to the language. And the difficulty is here, not only do we have common languages within different tr different tribes, um, you also have your own favorite terms that you like to use, and you're always negotiating with others outside of your tribe in terms of understanding those. Now, listen to his language. And I know for some of you, especially if, let's say, you grew up in a in a in a conservative Christian background, and you've had experience with this language and you've had reason to doubt. Right now, a good number of people are mourning the death of Rachel Held Evans, a young woman who um, actually, Rachel and I um, used to correspond before she got real big. She had found a Reformed Church of America church, and she had written a blog post on that, and I would comment on her blog post, and I watched her blogs get larger and larger and larger. And in fact, she uh, asked me to to write a review of her first book before it came out on my tiny little blog, which I did, and I was I was delighted to do so. And so I was, I'm you know I'm I'm deeply sorry to hear about her death, and my heart my heart goes out. There's the language again, and my prayers go out to her husband. And her two, her two. She's got a three-year-old and a one-year-old. This is, this is a terribly tragic thing. But Rachel Held Evans was right there at an inflection point, and she became a, an avatar, if you will, for a whole generation of people who grew up in a conservative Christian context, and found certain aspects in their context unbelievable. Um, disingenuous, inauthentic, uh, a good deal of stuff that they didn't like. And so often those people who have, let's say, followed Rachel Held Evans' trajectory will listen to this language and they'll just, they'll just be revolted by it. They, this, this, they get triggered by it. Others who perhaps, let's say, they've been political rivals to the religious right, they'll hear this stuff and scoff. Now you can do that, and and this is basically the same dynamic of well, Verveki talks about Buddhism, so I'm not going to listen to him. Okay, you can decide not to do that, but you also might, and this is one of my favorite rules of Peterson: listen to people as if you have something to learn, and that's really a very hard thing to do. And what you'll see, watch how closely Peterson listens to Nasser in this, because what Peterson is trying to do, and this will come out in the one more question video. Peterson is trying to piece this together. He's trying to understand. He's trying to penetrate the language and get through and at least understand it within his own categories and 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 see what he can learn. And and Peterson knows enough, especially with his background and the work that he had done in in sobriety and with twelve step programs. He knows, and he's talked about this before, that that. If someone has something, they're in the grip of alcoholism, there's some nice metaphors, then the grip of alcoholism, a, a religious conversion is powerful enough often to free them from it. Well, that's a transformation. But now, 
Christians have been talking about religious conversion for a very long time, way before the modern period, way before scientific language, and Christian language about this has been around, and Christian language describes these transformations, and, and languages, once they're used and once they're embedded within a community, languages become liturgies, and, and words, be, words take on power, and they take on power within these these contexts. We've talked about the non-player character meme, where where certain words just become, certain words get threadbare, uh, you know, get threadbare, as C.S. Lewis calls them, overused, and, and that can happen with language. So now, pay attention to David Nasser's language, and then pay attention to Jordan Peterson's language, and, and if you can, resist getting triggered and try to figure out if you can translate some of this language into another language and, and see if you can discern what's under the language to, to understand the worldview and how it works, the assumptions that are built into the language and built into the worldview and the presuppositions that are in there. Because if you can develop this skill, you'll find it handy in terms of relating to other communities beyond your own and, in fact, even understanding your own community. Aronsky, I want to make sure we don't miss this moment. Dr. Peterson, we can give David your 12 books, 12 rules in that book. We can give him your next book, which is 12 more rules. Watch how closely Peterson listens. Now, again, if you go to a VIP thing with Peterson, this, this is a dramatic thing when you meet Jordan Peterson in person. In these events, he listens very carefully. He is giving David Nasser his undivided attention. That is a powerful thing. And he can, they will be helpful to him. I, I gave your book to my daughter. See, so I, they will be helpful. I, gave, I even trusted my daughter with your book. They will be helpful to her. And helpful. And, and now again, notice now Christians are sometimes accused of being um, so heavenly minded they're of no earthly good. Uh, that's not David Nasser. David Nasser recognizes that there is wisdom in the world, and even if Jordan Peterson, his his relationship, his his reputation as a Christian is 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 complex in ways that David Nasser's is not, in ways that mine is not. Even if, as David Nasser is about to say, he sees some deficiencies in Jordan Peterson's public embrace of Christianity, he still finds the book helpful. Okay? So don't miss that point. I read the books. I see Bible verses attached around them. Justification. There's Bible verses here. So again, what, and this will show that people have all these little implicit measures about, well, I remember... It, people pay a lot of attention to presidents when they say, God bless you. Now, that cuts both ways. Some people say, well, they're not really a Christian. Um, but when presidents stop saying, God bless you, you, watch it now in the Democratic primaries. People are talking about it already. Which, can't, which, Democrat, which Democrats running for office are willing to mention God and which are not? Now, this goes beyond whether they go to church, how they themselves interact with the faith, so on and so forth, which faith they interact with. It has, but these are signals that people pay attention to. These are very low resolution, resolution signals that people pay attention to, to try to get a sense of, this is what we're always doing with each other, to try to predict what the other person's actions are going to be. And now they might say, God bless you, and then do something that you don't think is a Christian thing. And you might say, well, that is teaching me about their religious attitudes. They might refuse to say, God bless you, and then do some things that you like. I mean, this is how complex reality works. So again, you have to pay special, you have to pay real attention to the language and, and try and see what's at the heart of the matter. But without David submitting, bending his knee to Christ. Bending his knee to Christ. Well, what is that? Well, that's an action that, you know, 
Peterson, you know, you go all the way back to Peterson's encoding of the Bible, all those talks, okay? Bending the knee, this is an action. And Peterson will talk about the wolves, and you'll see dogs when the dog kind of turns up and takes a submissive pose. Bending the knee is taking a submissive pose. Bending the knee to Christ, that's the person signaling to the world that they are going to submit to Christ. And then there's a big word itself, obviously Jesus Christianity, all of this, but and what 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 David Nasser is saying that the person's heart has to adopt a posture of submission to Christ. This person, this movement, this set of beliefs, this community, institution, all of these things. That's what's encoded in David Nasser's in David Nasser's plea here. And just saying, I don't want to clean up the behavior or deal with the symptoms. What's broken in me is my heart doesn't belong to the Savior. And, and so obviously there's, there's language here, his heart belonging to the Savior, even that belonging to the Savior. Uh, recently, on a, you know, I'll often quote the first question and answer of the Heidelberg, Heidelberg Catechism. What is my only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong in body and soul and life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's right there. It's encoded in language, okay? And there's a whole drama that's connected with it. And David Nasser is summoning, evoking, bringing that drama right here into it and bringing it to Peterson and saying, this drama is foundational. It's powerful. It's effective. In other words, David can address all of the symptoms, but his heart must be changed. And if his heart is changed, then naturally other things will flow out of it. Now, obviously, one of the things that we're going to be talking about will be, this is where the second thing is going to be, the, the agency of Christ. Well, what on earth do we mean by that? Well, let's keep going. Who's sitting on the throne. Who's sitting on the throne. More symbolic language. And if you watched my sermon this past Sunday, all about the Lamb and the throne and the book of Revelation in chapter 4 and 5, this is how we talk. This is how we, how together we inhabit a shared symbolic world. Where, how does your book go beyond behavioral modification and walk into soul transformation? There it is. Soul transformation. This is what we're looking for. And, and right there, when you're contrasting behavioral modification versus soul transformation, well, behavioral modification is what you might do with your dog, okay? Where you are the agent, you are the mind colonizing the behavior of the dog. And he's contrasting that with soul transformation. Well, what is that? That means the heart of the mind, the motivational center, then in terms of everything it does going forward, strikes a certain path and pursues a different outcome. That's a transformation, okay? Well, let's see what Peterson has to say. Uh, you know, you, you got to get on a plane here in a minute and go back to Toronto. But David, so he's crying out for help. He needs someone who's omnipresent. He needs someone who's omnipresent. Now he's just evoked an entire worldview and an, an entire set of assumptions that, again, there is a God. That's God number two is omnipresent and when david cries out in prayer he can relate to this god and this god has power to act well act in what ways will change circumstances in his life change the feeling of his heart that's a powerful transformation that david is talking to now someone might say well i don't believe in god Certainly not God. Maybe God number one. I'm starting to listen to Jordan Peterson's, but I don't believe in God number two. I don't believe God, you know, listen to Sam Harris. I don't believe he hears our prayers. I don't believe he has power or interest in affecting change in my circumstance. You know, but what what David Nasser is talking about is a historical reality in that human transformations like conversions are real. You can, you can find them written about throughout history. And whether you think it's purely psychological or simply superstitious or what have you, transformations take place in people's lives. And whether you evaluate this to be a good thing or a bad thing, the transformation is real. 
And and what Dave what David is saying is that behavioral modification is not enough. And and again, we're evoking like being just just keeping a clean room is insufficient. Something there's a transformation that must happen. Which and this is where we can have this is where we can bring up. Jordan Peterson's referring to Piaget's equilibrated state. This transformation begins at the beginning, begins at the center, at the heart, permeates into a person's life, affects their relationships with their family, affects their co-workers, affects their view of the past, their view of the future, affects their neighborhood via other institutions like church, even impact and does good things out into the whole world. That's what he's evoking. And so, and so that's what Nasser is appealing to, saying, this David who rushed the stage needs a transformation which will get to the heart of him and radiate out into the rest of him and out into the rest of the world. And so can you just help us understand what does David do once he's done with the last page of, of your book and he begins to apply these things? Because I know a lot of cleaned up people that are just as messed up as he is. I'm that way sometimes. So what... So, so it's interesting because this is obviously David Nasser. There's there are a number of subtle games, and when I say games, I don't mean that they're manipulative or disingenuous. But but there's a lot of subtleties going on here with respect to there, there's a bit of a challenge that Nasser is giving him because Dave, says David Nasser is already saying this this transformation of of christian conversion and all of the stuff that's connected in terms of being in christ this transformation of christian conversion is fundamental and jordan can you match that and and see now what jordan is going to say now jordan is jordan recognizes the power of christian conversion to make positive change in people's lives but jordan is by virtue of his action and I ought to rightly judge him by his action, by virtue of how he says we should be judged. Skeptical about the church and its programs for this kind of positive transformation. And so Jordan, in many ways, has his own programs for positive transformation. And now I am not trying to set up a one versus the other. And in fact, David Nasser has basically said, Jordan, your programs for levels of personal transformation are powerful. We recognize them. We appreciate them. We celebrate them. In fact, we, we think they're so good. We ourselves are going to promote your project and encourage our students to read your book and encourage our students to listen to you and encourage our students to work on those particular levels of transformation. But David Nasser is saying that there is a deeper, more fundamental level of transformation that even your book cannot come to. And so he's challenging Jordan Peterson to say, do you recognize that level? Can you reach that level? Can you talk about that level? Can you tell me, how does Christ not just become a perfect model and behavior police, but how does he become who he says he is when he claims to be God in David's life? Well, this... And See, part of the problem is I, I record these I record these conversations with people and then they get delayed because I fit them in in my channel. I kind of store them up for when I go on vacations too. Jesus, Jesus at the end of the Gospel of Matthew stands on a mountain and says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And, and sometimes people will say to me, "Well, I don't believe in the virgin birth. I don't believe in those miracles." But I think Jesus was a I think Jesus was a really cool and uh, enlightened individual. And I think, well, then you probably don't believe that the Gospels are faithful witnesses to the kinds of things he said. Because if someone came into your life and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, we'd say, uh, that's BS. Um, you know, can you walk on water? Can you still a storm? Can you raise the dead? That's a startling statement by anyone. And it sets up C.S. Lewis's famous trilemma, which, which Jordan Peterson has referred to. But, you know... Well, is this Jesus alive? Is Jesus available? If I pray, does he listen? Does that is does does the loop get completed? I mean, these are all the questions that you know Sam Harris is skeptical about. These are all the questions that people really want to know because 
if in fact there is a person who has in fact all authority on heaven and earth, well, I want to know. We, we, we talked about this a little bit last night about the idea that, and, and I wouldn't say that my ideas are fully formulated about this. Like, and, and so Peterson continues to say, I'm, I, I'm, I keep thinking about it and I'm not ready to give final definitive answers. There, one of the things that Carl Jung pointed out was that when you matured, you needed to replace your father with the father. Right, because otherwise your father stayed the father. And, and that wasn't good because there's a confusion there between the individual. Now, I'm not going to play the whole thing, but you notice where he took this in terms of, okay, now we're going to talk psychologically. But again, David Nasser is invoking a man that David Nasser believes is still alive. And that this man that David Nasser believes is still alive has claimed to have all authority in heaven and on earth. And in fact, in the Apostles' Creed, sits at the right hand of God the Father and someone that we can talk to. You know, let's, whatever side of the Christian line you're on here, you know, that's a pretty audacious claim. So be, you know, be a little patient with people that, are skeptical about it. Understandably so. But there's the language, meaning, transformation, the vivid display of the separated magisteria. And, and right there, so you've got David Nasser in this language making these huge claims and Jordan Peterson saying, and, and speaking psychologically. And, and Jordan Peterson better than most understands where a lot of these lines are and that's part of the reason he will he will stick to the psychological part of the line because like he keeps telling us again and again he's still thinking about the metaphysical in terms of the claims he wants to make and as the point i've made quite a bit too in terms of the public conception of the modernist framework um, you only trot out in public claims that can be verified scientifically and other metaphysical claims you keep private. That's kind of the modernist way of doing this, and we see this practiced in places like the United States. It's not practiced in places like the Islamic world, in Iran, or in any Islamic republic where they say that the metaphysical claims and the scientific claims are are both out in public and the metaphysical claims trumpet, which is why in Iran there are imams that are technically in charge of the whole country. And there's a political there's a political realm which is below them, which can which is can be a manager of things, but but the imam can always trump what the politicians do. And, and again, if you understand the worldview, you can see why it's set up that way. Now, as I noted here, Christian narratives assume and presume active metaphysical agents. Now, Jonathan Peugeot made the comment in, in his recent question and answer video that he wants to talk to me and um, talk to Jonathan anytime Jonathan wants to talk to me. Um, nothing's not, uh, Any day that I talk to Jonathan is a good day. Uh, and I continue to wish Jonathan well in terms of the flood and all of that that's going on. But but to be clear, in Christianity, there is no division between God number one and God number two. Christianity say they're one God. And I, I, said, I talked about God number one and God number two because of the Jordan Peterson-Sam Harris conversation where Sam Harris asked Jordan Peterson, well, what do you mean by God? And Jordan Peterson gives this long list of answers, which most people would listen to and kind of scratch their head and think, well, what exactly is he talking about? And Sam Harris says, well, that's not really God. And then Sam Harris goes off to talk about another type of God. And that's why I said Jordan Peterson is talking about God number one and Sam Harris is talking about God number two. And, and that God number one and God number two roughly align with God number one is God's imminence. God built into creation. In him we live and move and have our being, and the whole earth is full of his glory. And God number two is the relational, transcendent 
God who is an active agent in history. And of course, those are together because God is everywhere because he's God number one. And God is a living God because he's God number two. In Christianity, those are there's no division or separation within them. But they kind of get pulled apart when in the West we go through this process of, of, of providential deism, as Charles Taylor talks about. So there is no division in the Christian God. Uh, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit acts in the world. And we're going to have to do a lot more talking about what spirit is eventually. Human beings live in personal relationship with God in consequential ways. And the Bible is a story of the kinds of consequences in terms of a relational um, relational posture between God and humanity, God and his rebellious creation. The consequences play out in this age, in the historical world, in real public time and space, as well as in the age to come. After the public conclusion and transformation of the physical world, I should change that, as we know it, that's the Christian narrative, which is prefigured in the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. That's why the, the bodily resurrection of Jesus is so important to the entire narrative, because the, the final transformation of the physical universe is tied to the transformation of Jesus' body that happens after death in the tomb and causes his leaving the tomb and causes him to be with his disciples and be touched by Doubting Thomas and to eat a fish and to stand on a mountain and say, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And all of these things, that's part of the narrative. And if you, with it, this is where we're going to, labels are going to get complicated again. Again, if I think, if you take out the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, you no longer have Christianity as it has been traditionally asserted by the Apostle Paul, by the Apostle Peter, by the earliest accounts of Christianity, because the physical resurrection of Jesus is connected with the physical transformation of the entire cosmos. Okay, Those things are connected. Those things are, are joined symbolically, and our resurrect, re, resurrection is connected to the physical resurrection of Jesus. That's why these things are so essential. That's the Christian narrative. And so now when David Nasser talks about a transformation of the heart, Christianity sees that as the beginning of a process which will actually culminate in the trans formation of Jesus that you see in the passion narrative from crucifixion to resurrection to ascension. That's one seamless process in the Christian narrative. And that's why David Nasser can listen to the psychological transformations. Now, now Christians embrace psychological transformation, but they say that is also in continuity and connected with this other transformation of the heart that Christians use symbolic language of asking Jesus into my heart or Jesus making me new or all of these things. And hopefully in the next videos, I'm going to use some ways to connect that with part of what we're doing is trying to reconcile heaven and earth. Jesus in his Lord's Prayer Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's Those are the connections he's trying to use. Okay. But there are deep metaphysical assumptions and assertions built in. Post-enlightenment skepticism about existence of God and public permission of, speak, of speaking of divine speech and action stalks all of these conversations. And this is what Peterson is struggling. Now, Nasser is embedded in a Christian college where in that context... There's no loss of status of using traditional Christian language. In fact, there's loss of status in being reticent about using Christian language. Go to a public university and that context flips. There's loss of status of using Christian language and there's better status avoiding using Christian language, which means that this process of translation with respect to transformations is, is vital. And this is where someone like John Verveke is really helpful because this is where we're all trying to understand each other and, and look for a common language where that we can use without necessarily losing status because of political 
and religious biases that, that are deeply embedded and built into the institutions and the communities. So, so religious language is tolerated privately in the public space, in a secular space, but, but there's often a status hit. And again, Dallas, see Dallas Willard's Veritas Forum about worldviews on that, because Dallas is right, because worldviews are often picked up not so much by direct association, but by status signaling. There's a, an organization called Young Life. Young Life is a Christian evangelistic organization that works to evangelize um, high school and college kids. For a while, Young Life had something like, so it was called something like the key, the key student program. What they recognized was that if a high status student publicly converted to Christianity, lots of other students would. Why? Because what we often do with respect to our worldview assumptions, this is the, the programming of the elephant, is we, want, we pay attention to status. And if high status people convert, other people will follow them. This is why so often it's very important for a lot of Christians, if the winner of the Super Bowl is a Christian, they'll stand on stage and what will they say? First, I'd like to give glory to God. Bang! status, worldview. Now you might say, well, is he explaining the four spiritual laws or is he explaining the gospel or is he, now put any language game on it, once that person of high status expresses, expresses an association with a worldview, that worldview moves up in the hierarchy. You say, well, that's really terrible. Well, it's the basis for our commercial marketing system. Why do we have celebrity endorsements all over the place? When I visited Australia, I was surprised how many Hollywood actors are doing endorsements for product. Lipstick or makeup or cars or food or brands, what have you. Look at how Apple with its, with its iPod and earbud and iPhone ads, you even just have the silhouette of a famous high status person like, like Bono from YouTube. And then you have the white earbuds or the white ear thing and bang, everybody, the, the elephant immediately picks up on that. And I want higher status. I want to be like Bono. I don't want to be like Beyonce. I want to be like Trump. I want to be like Obama. That's the way this stuff works. That's how we work. And now you can talk to the writer all day long, but boy, if someone loses status for being a Christian, a lot of people are going to say, I don't want to lose status. I'd rather have my status over this public Christian identity. All right. But then now listen to this conversation between Peter and Nasser, because now they really start getting into the weeds because Peter want, Peterson wants to know about transformations. Expect. Your question is more about personality transformation in general and um, uh, and how it plays out even into the trenches of addictions. I mean, OK, now, again, pay attention, because the heart in terms of Christian symbolic language, the heart is the center of the person. If that heart is changed, the changes will permeate out will will will, will permeate out into the rest of the person. And so we're talking about broader transformations and often. You know, let's say someone goes to AA, they, okay, they need to, they need to get their life under control. They need to no longer be addicted to alcohol. They need to work on that. Well, okay, let's say once you got alcohol licked, well, you've still got lots of other areas of your life that need sorting out. It, it makes a lot of sense if you can look at a transformation at the core that will, in fact, continually move out and make their life better. If you actually look at the 12 steps, there, there's a lot of that built into the 12 steps. If you're working your 12 steps, you have to go and make amends to the people that you've hurt because of your alcoholism. And you might have to make amends to other people that you've hurt even because of other things besides the alcoholism. So this is these are the transformations they're talking about. And, and what's really cool is, is in this conversation, they're going to get right to the point of, well, well, where is the agent? What is actually moving this forward? I mean, I'm a Your question is more about personality transformation in general. And um, 
uh, and how it plays out even into the trenches of addictions. I mean, I'm uh, a, I'm a yeah. Christian. I, I, I became a Christian when I was 18. My addictions. He's talking about a transformation. I became a Christian when I was 18. This, in terms of Christian symbolic language, is a huge transformation, although Christians also understand that the, the how this permeates out into the rest of one's life is a slow and often inconsistent and, in this world, unfinished process. It didn't, didn't stop, you know, tempting me, you know, and it's not just even the things that I that I had before I became a Christian. I've had, I've added new, new temptations as a, as a believer, trust me. See, and he's saying that often Christians like to promote this really clean narrative. And, and a lot of Christian liturgies, a lot of Christian liberty, lit, liturgies, cultural liturgies lead to a fair amount of cynicism because someone will stand on stage and say, well, my life has totally changed. Well, will it stay changed? Uh, will it will it be changed in all of your areas? Um, and then people say, well, Christians have owned slaves, Christians have raped, Christians have killed, Christians have cheated, Christians fall back, you know, backslide, all of this stuff. And so there's a amount of cynicism about this transformation. Is this transformation real? And if you think that this these conversations are energetic between Christians and non-Christians, they're just as energetic within Christian communities. So-and-so did this, and they call themselves a Christian, on and on and on and on. And, and so then Christians are always talking about, well, well what does it mean that we're... Oh, that we we've been transformed and and how extensive is that transformation and do i do i feel that transformation and and does it mean that things are easy and so david nasser he is he is qualifying and and being very honest and open about what this is like for him and and as a high status christian minister this is this is how we understand it in the christian community they don't Christian. I've had I've added new new temptations as a, as a believer. Trust me, mm -hmm. they don't go away. Um, but rather than tapping into self power or tapping mm -hmm. into even good things like the accountability of a community. So so now he's going to differentiate between okay this this agent that I call myself that I do on my own and then other techniques I can have around me such as accountability. Now he's going to pull in. Well, what about divine power. Now, again, in a secular age, we're skeptical about this. Part of secularity, um, Charles Terrell talks about is the buffered self, that, that we are, we are living this iron box of secularity. We are buffered from God. Uh, if there is a God, he can't help us or is unwilling to help us or won't help us, so on and so forth. Again, this metaphysical world is all built into all of this language. And if you're skeptical about those metaphysical assumptions and you listen to this, you'll say, that's just, you know, yeah, that's just how Christians talk. I don't believe any of it. Be and those kind of things. Um, well, for me, it's in so inside out. I just have to continue mm. to preach to myself. I have to preach to myself. Okay. There's another. There's another. You know, Christian liturgy. I have to preach. I have to remind myself of my identity. Now, now, what's really helpful again with the Verveki stuff is that John is giving us a language of a number of these things, and we're going to talk about that and explore that. That. They're, they're basically encoded into Christian language, and we hear David use them. But they're not translatable into, they're not translatable or understood, in a sense, outside of the Christian silo. Um, well, it's a funny I'm issue. I'm acting eh? in contradiction to my new identity when I succumb to it. And I do succumb to it sometimes. But when I do, I have to tell myself, I just acted in contradiction to my new identity, not as a compliment to my new identity. So, so as a Christian, I mean, you're called upon ethically to act in a Christian manner. Okay, so that's you. So that's one agent. Yes, sir. And so there's obviously some um, assumption that your voluntary actions are part and parcel of an ethical requirement and also part and parcel of the faith. See, now what Peterson is working on right here is this question of well, what agent is doing this and how can we conceive of these agents and what language can we work on them and work with to understand them better? But then there's also the 
the cor correlated claim that so they're connected the salvation is through Christ okay so there's another agent now how to understand that agent and so there's a there's a there's a there's a funny contradiction there that's difficult to reconcile and this is a contradiction that <laughs> We've been, that sparked in many ways, a part of the contradiction that sparked the Protestant Reformation and continues to energize it. And, well, what? Which is that, on the one hand, it's the action of something transcendent that's leading you out of perdition. It's God number two. But on the other hand, you're still called upon to act as voluntarily as an active agent. That's us as agents. And so it's a very tricky business to separate out how much you... How much? Now we're trying to quantify. Put on the person, let's say. What's God's part? What's my part? As we're two agents. And this is why, again, figuring out language of the agency of God. Now, we're talking about aspect number two. Okay. But... In Christianity, God, num God is God number one and God number two in Christianity. But aspect number two, what what is what is basically the question is when how does God act? And and this is where you get into God acts through what? Well, through circumstances. He's God number one, so it's it's all through. It's in fact built into me from my experiences, from my genetics, from my hereditary, from my culture, from all of these things. And and part of the difficulty with the split that happens in God between God number one and God number two is that once they're split, suddenly you no longer can understand how Jesus can still a storm or walk on water. Jesus can still a storm and walk on water because God number one and God number two are together. And you can read about this again in the, the Christ song in, in, in Colossians. You know, by him all things were made. First chapter of John, the Logos. I mean, this is, this is what Christianity said. And so when Jesus comes to earth, well, comes to earth, but he's been here before, and in fact, everything was built by him he's coming into he's coming into the kingdom that he made with his hands and nature is his servant again read c.s lewis's miracles this is up to you this is your responsibility to draw the bow back and to hit the target properly and how much you attribute to the grace of god that allows that to occur now grace again <laughs> the zizek talk when, when Peterson and Zizek keep talking about grace, when they talk about grace, they're talking about divine agency. Now, they're, again, they're within the secular box, and so they're both speaking as, well, we're not going to speak as Christians, but there's this dynamic of grace, and sometimes you might say that's luck or chance or good fortune, but there's this, there's this grace, and that's... God, this is this is the action of God in a sense, distinct from what we ourselves can do. And so I came. I, I was a Muslim, you know, uh, before I became a Christian. And before it was always the responsibility was there, you know. Um, it's hey, as a responsible religious person, here's the list of do's and here's the list of don'ts. And by the way, they were all good for me. <laughs> You know, those lists of do's were like, don't, they, they were good do's. And the list of don'ts were, you know, they were not evil. They were actually for my benefit. Uh, they have a lot more than 12 rules. <laughs> They've got a lot of rules. And even on the Old Testament side, there's over 600 do's and don'ts of the Mosaic law. But it was no longer for me. Um, responsibility is reimagined in the life of a believer and that it's my response to his ability. And so response. And, and now... He's barking at the structure of the Heidelberg Catechism here. And those of you who follow my rough drafts or my sermons know that I often structure the conclusion of my sermon, misery, deliverance, gratitude. Because that's the way the Heidelberg Catechism structures the, the relationship. And now it's, I, I don't think we can 
really tease apart this, what, what, exactly what Peterson's getting at here, this tension that he sees. But if you need something to go with, and so I think misery, deliverance, gratitude is about the best we've got. Say, so, okay, God acts, I respond. And the, the, the work that I do, while it certainly... Well, it certainly helps me move further down the road. Now I'm using a metaphor. Um, it is it is the grace of God that is the transformative element that changes my heart. Responsibility is now that I'm a Christian, I'm responsible to love my neighbor, to love the Lord with my heart, soul, mind, and strength. First of all, I'm going to fail at that. So Christ has already done it for me. He's the perfect model. Second. Um, I'm walking in obedience, not to earn his favor, but because I've already been given. And so I feel like the, the power has been put in me. That's resurrection power. Now I've just got to walk it out. I've got to flesh it out. I've got to grow in it. Uh, by the way, I say that. Yeah, so that's I've already another, sinned a lot so that's today. That's a funny one too, because that's that same contradiction eh, is that, that, and so, so, I mean, when I'm thinking about these things metaphysically, I think, um, so there's a Christian idea that Christ died on the cross to save us from our sins and to redeem the world, and I think. Well, one of the things Carl Jung pointed out was that part of the reason the, the, uh, the, the enlightenment emerged was because there was observations in Christendom that there was still a lot of redemption that seemed to need to occur despite the fact that this miraculous event had manifested itself this this idea here is peterson will allude to this fairly regularly that okay so there is a let let let's suppose even though you know he had to say with sam harris breathing down his neck almost certainly not let's suppose it really happened so what how does the resurrection where is that is it just kind of a one-off event that happened okay so let's say jesus is alive and then he walked around and showed himself to his friends boop blown up into the sky does it matter what do we mean by that does it does it shape matter can it move matter can it you know that's the, there's the question christians obviously say yes but but peterson is struggling with this and so you have this contradiction that the redemption has already taken place but there's still all the problems in the world and so the way that i've reconciled that to myself conceptually speaking metaphysically is that well the the death and resurrection of christ and it has to do with with a different concept of time uh, time it's it's how we resolve a lot of our problems and, and this isn't a bad way to think about it and in fact as as I continue to pursue this project, I know that there are videos ahead of me where, we'll, where I'm going to be talking about time with respect to this. Because when we talk about the transformations and, and when we look at some of what Verveke is going to have to say, time gets involved in this. Because the built into the Christian conception of resurrection, especially if understood within traditional Christianity, resurrection means and resurrection to no longer decay decay is all about time decay is a very important concept in the new testament jesus talks about it in the in the sermon on the mount paul in the in first corinthians 15 notes that jesus new body is not subject to decay what does that mean well, well time and decay that comes in here now yeah, we're, we're going to get a lot more into this stuff as we go forward. I suppose, is the death and resurrection of Christ has redeemed the world, but we still have work to do. And that those two things can, can be together. I mean, the Logos has always been regarded as something outside of time, right? right. It's, it's, it's outside of the past and the present and the future. It encompasses all of that. And so in some sense, something, there, there's a level of analysis outside of time where something could have already been accomplished, but within time, which is where we are, well, there's still plenty to do. And it seems to me that I, the reason I'm stating that that's a metaphysical statement is because, well, it's, it's complicated and paradoxical, but it seems to me to be correct is that there's a, there's a pathway laid out. It, it manifests itself to us, at least in part, in the voice of our conscience. 
and in, in, in our knowledge of our ethical responsibility, and well, in our knowledge of good and evil, and the, the ideal, the redemptive ideal is there to beckon and to call and to aid us, mm. but there's no complacency. There's still the battle that we each have to undertake. And you can see this tension within Christianity itself, you know, because the Orthodox Christians, for example, place a, a lot more emphasis, in my understanding, on the action of the individual, the attempt to become Christ-like. Well, we're going to talk a lot about that as we get into, especially the next video, which is going to be on transformations. In, in next video, I say, unless something big happens and I make another video and get distracted, which is always my problem. Action and attitude and less on the turning over of the redemptive process to the to the to the redemptive figure see and i'm not sure that contrast i'd love to talk to jonathan about that because i'm not sure that con that that's a fair representation of the contrast because christianity the language of the bible wrestles with this and it's like god through me well, what on earth does that mean well, how can i how can I translate that that into other language that actually connects up with the common language we have working today? Do we have the categories for it? And so the Protestants and the Orthodox have been arguing about that for a long time. Protestants and Orthodox haven't been arguing about much because the, <laughs> the Protestants and the Catholics have been arguing and the Orthodox have kind of been over there a ways and um, the Protestants and the Orthodox haven't had a lot of contact. Absolutely. And, and I don't know how to rectify that. I yes, mean, sir. I don't think Jesus is trying to redeem the world around me. I don't think Jesus... See, and this is where I have a real disagreement with Nasser. <laughs> and this is where we get into Peter Kreef's conversation on, um, and the Eric Metaxas show. Peter Kreef did a show on with Eric Metaxas and just wrote a book, a dialogue about sacraments. And what Nasser says right there is a very Protestant thing to say, and I think it's dead on wrong because uh, Jesus died for squirrels and these, Jesus died for trees. Jesus, God so loved the world that includes us and our rebellious part, but also includes the physical creation and all of this. And God is not going to, God is going to redeem and reclaim and renew the entire cosmos. So I understand what, Nar what Nasser is trying to say there, but we'll pick this up in another video. That's 2332. That's kind of nice and easy to remember. So get that to Verveke. What he's doing with his cognitive science is giving us some categories that I think are really helpful in terms of translating the language. And one of the things that he talks about in, in one of his videos is the having versus being mode. And, and these, are, these are really helpful observations. So often we get confused that by having things, this will change my being and it won't. So I buy a new car and for a while, you know, I drive in that new car and, you know, and oh, wow, this is impacting my being but as, as very little property as very little this is when we're going to talk about transformations it, it doesn't it, it doesn't sink very deep and and so the being things the being aspects and and what's interesting is that i don't play music on my channel i don't want to get into that whole mess on youtube but um you know there's this one song that we sing sometimes at our church knowing you jesus knowing you there is no other way you know all the things of the world that i've had and you know jesus talks about this paul talks about this you know i count it as lost because knowing and being and and having god well how can you have god god is way too big for you to have but it's it's a different kind of having and what's good about verveki is that he's teasing out these different elements of language and and differentiating them so that when we wade in with our liturgical symbolic practiced rehearsed language which is usually only understood within our little insulated group we can use these categories to help translate this and have other people who are you know have other people understand what we're saying so there's having versus being mode and there's the agent arena relationship which i was just thinking about this morning is is such a helpful thing and when i listen to other preachers or to tim keller or 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 john piper talk about 
when they employ kind of their new twist on Christianity, and this is what we see in Christianity all the time, preachers come along with new twists that, that add insight. And it's where the, the context have changed and the language has changed. So the preacher has to come in and, and again, negotiate the transaction between these worlds. That's what preachers are doing. And, and so when we find, when we find uh, John Piper talking about his, his Christian hedonism, and when we find Tim Keller talking about realizing the gospel, and actually David Nasser just used some of that language because preachers steal from each other. So David Nasser stealing some stuff from, from Tim Keller and, and that whole tradition from the Gospel Coalition. You, you, you take some of this language and you use it in a different way. Well, the agent arena relationship, you know, so often what happens... I tell this story about Mabel, who's who's this woman in a nursing home, told in a told in a story in a book by John Ortberg, "The Life You've Always Wanted." That this Mabel, who's in a nursing home, and in the in having mode, you imagine that she has nothing because she doesn't have health, and she's in a crappy nursing home, and she can't even smell the flower, and she's blind and can hardly see, and her face is being eaten away by cancer, but she says. She's never been happier. Why? Well, that's the agent arena relationship. She's living by virtue of her faith in a different arena, even though you walk into a nursing home and see her, the squalor and the difficulty with which she is living in this in this other realm. And so the agent arena relationship, that is an enormously powerful idea. And what that does is gives me, helps me understand language already, stories already built into my Christian religion and helps me understand why they work and why they're so powerful and helps me articulate and explain it to other people that the, the agent, which is Mabel, and the arena, which is her crappy nursing home, what she does is is via, there's a powerful thing that, that transforms her from being a, a woman, an old woman dying in a crappy nursing home to a saint living already beginning to tread the foothills of the kingdom of God, even while she sits there. And so when that young preacher comes and gives her a, pl a flower, pretty soon the power of Mabel's arena becomes present to this young preacher. And now every time he visits her, He's in her arena. And you might say, well, how can a woman in a nursing home take over? And now suddenly it's like something you see in the movie. We weren't sitting in a nursing home where there's the smell of urine and where there's minimum wage, poorly trained people doing their best to change diapers on, on people who are being warehoused for the last bits of their years. But suddenly it's holy ground. Because this one woman has power. Well, well, how can this woman have power? She doesn't have power in spite of her cancer. She doesn't have power in spite of her blindness. She doesn't have power in spite of her disabilities. She has power because of them, because of the agent arena relationship. And just that language, agent arena relationship, it's like, boom, whole new vistas as a preacher open up to me because... By John Verveke showing me that relationship, I say, oh, now whole things that I have seen but haven't been able to articulate, now I can talk about. Now I can see. Now I can, in fact, homiletically show that a person who has no status in this world, in fact, becomes something like, you know, becomes a transform transformative person that not only can bear witness to transformation in her own life, but can transform a crappy nursing home into the kingdom of God. That's power. And that's in John Ortberg's book, uh, The Life You've Always Wanted, The Story of Mabel. You can look it up. Maybe I'll put the, the link to it on my blog because I've had it for years. It's been a, it's been a go-to sermon uh, illustration that I use. The agent arena relationship. What is the greatest hoped for achievable sumum bodum? And this is when when John and I do talk. This is this is one of the things that we'll get into because I think what Christianity continues to be able to do is access a metaphysical level, and it certainly makes metaphysical claims. And and this is where the resurrection of Jesus comes in. Um, there's the emotional existential. 
finding sense of meaning happiness fulfillment and this gets into time we we there are you know uh jim croce's song if i could put time in a bottle what's he talking about he's talking about the existential versus the historical physical material if i could put time in the bottle basically says in this moment a transformation has taken place and i want to i want to stop time and stay in this moment that's what jim croce sings if i could put time in a bottle so so the transformations can must transformations be momentary and we have this when we listen to a song and we're momentarily transformed and and no matter how terrible life is there it is suddenly i was just talking to someone who was you know you look at prisoners a lot of good ministry happens in prison because religions are very powerful in prison because they need something powerful in order to change the agent arena relationship they can't have anything so they have to transform the being mode this is part of the reason that it's it's often the wealthy struggle with respect to religion while the poor and the suffering grab onto it because there's no point in manipulating these other things this is all they got and as Jordan Peterson says, humanity has an incredible capacity for for this kind, these kinds of transformation. We're gonna have to talk about that. And we're gonna have to talk about public, private, and then justifiable belief, because that's a big thing that stalks all of these conversations. So transformations. Does having securing material circumstance objects transform you? Not if you're in prison. Addressing deprivation, yes. Beyond organism security, well, you know, there's a happiness curve in terms of once your bills are paid, more money doesn't necessarily make you more happy. Well, and now suddenly we then we look for different things. Psychotechnologies, the delivery of goods beyond and even in spite of physical circumstance. World religions and philosophies deal with these matters. This is where we're talking about the meaning crisis, that part of how we set up the world and and i think a lot of it how we have i think a lot of it frankly has to do with our consumerist culture commercials not only try to get you to buy soap or soda or ipads or cars or houses or services or whatnot they also underneath shape and form your worldview and so there's a lot going on here in terms of the meaning crisis. It's important to recognize that our treatment of them in our secular public um, context, we frame off metaphysics and try and keep it at the epistemological and axiology agent. That's the Paul Maxwell video that I played in some of my other videos about belief. So are we up to it there? So, okay, Verveke series. There's an overview of the religion, philosophies, and psychotechnologies. Uh, creative and well taught, situated within a secular frame, though. And now, this this is something that we have to come to terms with. That it's it's very interesting that part of what now I am I am someone who thinks that re freedom of religion is a good thing. But part of what has been achieved in America because of secularity has has given, in a sense, an open marketplace for religions to communicate and converse and there's freedom of speech and freedom of religion and freedom of conscience so that we can actually do this work and i think overall that's a good thing you know it's amazon for example sometimes when amazon sells their own products they come at you know they they get at odds with their competitors is amazon going to sell the the um the chromecast piece or or not um so you know what what's nice supposed what's supposed what's potentially helpful about the open marketplace of ideas is that well we can exchange because people are going to have different different the, the religious pluralism in the world is is a fact what's the best way to address this secularity isn't a bad way so often you might hear me critical of secularity in terms of politics there are some good things and and some good outcomes from it now with each philosophy as as Verveke goes through it he's noting the mechanisms potential and shortcomings of their delivery of transfer of transformations and 
again, my next video, I've already started making the slides for it. We're going to talk more about these transformations and, and what they are and, and what their shelf life is and what their expectations are and what their promises are. And, and then people are going to evaluate them themselves. Um, but, but don't forget the secular frame. And as I just said, that, that's sometimes a very helpful thing. In terms of a, if you go to a Christian college, you almost always feel like, well, maybe the Christians have their thumb on the scale. And, and so you say, well, we want, a, we want an open secular platform and we're going to adopt this sort of language so that everybody gets a fair shot. And that's really what, what, um, what Verveke is trying to do. However, not only do you have the problem of the thumb on the scale, the opposite problem of that is that every secular space cannot be purely secular. Secularity has its own implications and complexities that... Um, in a sense, a Christian college will up front give you what their presuppositions are. In other words, they're not saying, they're not playing any, you know, these are my cards, this is what I'm saying up front, or I'm not aware of my own presuppositions and how they're impacting the presentation. So there's, you know, there's upsides and downsides to both methods. Well, well let's, we're going to not get into 16, but the end of 15, where he begins to address Christianity, and we're going to get into Kairos, Logos, and Transformation. And, and what, I really, what I really appreciated about this tease, which, again, he got into the next week, but the beginning of talking about Christianity. Now, again, you'll hear a lot of qualifications, and I'll actually not play a lot of those, because he, you know, I'm, He's not trying to give you the whole thing. He's it's from his own perspective, so on and so forth. But one of the things I think he offers here is a really powerful sense of how love functions transformationally. And I think he articulates well the power of it in a way that I thought I found very moving. And I will, quite frankly, rip off. So um, let's uh, let's let's hear what he does with it. So, Tillich, the same Paul Tillich who wrote The Courage to Be, talked about kairos, about that perspectival part. Now, now you know that Peterson talked about time. And so, again, as I said, these transformations re interact with time. And now, as Verveke is about to say, Greek, the Greek, Greek has two words for time, chronos and kairos. And kairos is kind of a, a moment of transformation. Chronos is kind of the chronometer. It's kind of running time, okay? And so one of the things that when we talk about transformations, we're going to have to come to terms with is kairos as in terms of transformation, but how do kairos and chronos actually relate to one another with respect to transformations? Participatory knowing, knowing the fullness of time, knowing exactly the right time. So some, right, that are going to, the, the right timing to shift the course of events. What Pascal, when we come to Pascal, we'll talk about is the spirit of finesse. The right, you know, there's, you're not yet in a romantic relationship with Susan and you kiss her. And if it, is it the right time? If you get the timing right, if the kairos is right, then the course of your relationship is altered, transformed. And your identity and her identity changed. Now, the, the Israelite conception was, the, was this for, was for the whole nation, and God would intervene chirotically at moments in history. Christianity is going to propose this radical idea that God's creative logos the word he speaks through the prophets, that it's, it's the same word by which he speaks things into existence. The, the word that cr helps create history. The word that causes kairos, makes kairos possible for us. So logos doesn't mean just spoken words. It means like the intelligibility, the formative principle, the underlying structure. Christianity, it's in the Gospel of John, Anarche and Logos, in the beginning was the Logos. A passage actually probably 
lifted from Stoicism. But what is John appropriating it to say? He's saying that God's capacity for producing kairos through logos has been identified, or to use an older term, incarnated in a particular individual. That Jesus of Nazareth is actually the ultimate kairos, that all the other kairoses were pointing to him and are summed up in him. That he represents the ultimate turning point. And he represents it not only historically, he represents it personally. Because he is a person, you can identify with him, and that kairos can come to take place in you personally. Now again, if you listen to Nasser earlier, this is what Nasser is talking about to Jordan Peterson on the stage about David who rests the stage. Just like Socrates personalizes the axial revolution and brings it into a direct personal confrontation, the encounter with Jesus means that you too can experience a profoundly personal kairos, which Jesus seems to have spoken about using a metaphor of being born again. About such... I, I shouldn't pause and because here's one of the difficulties that almost anything that you say about any of these passages you can talk about and have a discussion about because they have been so look at all these books behind me they have been so gone over and this is a tiny little library compared to everything that's out there they've been so gone over um i i'd uh born again is it's really born from above and despite the the catchphrase that got going in the 70s uh, because there's a wordplay in greek born again and born from above and, and nicodemus takes it as born again and jesus born from above well if you understand the gospel of john god comes from above i'll be going into the gospel of john in my sunday school class which you can catch the videos on on my church channel but but no this is and i think again Verveke is laying out here with this other language what Christianity claims and you know he's doing a, a really good job of it now there'll be some aspects that that again almost everything can be kvetched over but it's it's here it's a radical metanoia a radical shifting this is often translated as conversion and so you read about that, right? But th this word is much closer to awakening. Noia means noticing. This is your perspectival awareness. And meta means a, a be beyond. It's a beyond mind. So now notice what Verveke is doing. He's connecting, he's helping these traditions talk to each other. Now again, this is, this is terribly fraught. And you can do this in a secular university because in a sense nobody's got their thumb on the scale. But yeah, sure, you have your presuppositions. You've always got this dynamic you've got to deal with. But now, well, how do... How, what, what is conversion, transformation, this, this meta-mind, noia mind this, this meta-mind, this, this is a... This, it's an enlightenment of sorts. That's what conversion is. But now notice that David Nasser was using the heart language. And, and you can use two languages to talk about the same thing. We do it all the time. This means a radical transformation in your salience landscape, a radical transformation of right, what it's like to be you. It's this deeply perspectival and participatory transformation. And Jesus is saying he incarnates the principle by which you can intervene in your own personal history, or by which maybe you want to say intervention can occur See, and right there, he's navigating the dynamic that Peterson was wrestling with. Is this, is this Jesus giving me the power to do this? Is this Jesus doing it to me? Is this Jesus doing it through me? Your own personal history, such that this metanoia, you will have a new mind, a new heart, a new modal 
existence. You will be born again. What? What's going on there? What was, what does this kairos look like? What could possibly so radically transform my salience landscape, my sense of self, my processes of co-identification? What could bring that about? And now I'm going to say the word, and then you're going to laugh because it sounds like a Hallmark card. The Christian answer is love, and now we all titter. <laughs> that's, so, that's so quaint. <laughs> love. Sounds like, oh, love. Okay, the problem with that, as you've seen many times, is that this word is trivialized for us. We use one word to talk about so many different things, like I love peanut butter cookies. I love Canada. I love Sarah. I love my son. I love a really good, right, game of tennis. Are those the same? We're, we're even confused about this. We think that love is an emotion. No, it's not. Love is a modal way of being. Love isn't a feeling, and it is not an emotion. How do I know this? Because loving someone can be expressed by being sad when they're absent, being happy when they're present, being jealous when there's somebody else around, being angry when they're neglecting you. Love isn't a feeling. It isn't an emotion. It is a modal way of being. It is an agent arena relationship. right there that agent arena relationship love is an agent re love that so now you're getting into the the transformative power how this transforming works and what jesus seemed to be incarnating as a kairos to change the history of the world and to offer you to change your own personal history is a different kind of love this is agape. We have to distinguish between three kinds of love, eros, philia, and agape. See, eros is the love. Now, now I should say that this is a huge conversation in New Testament scholarship, Christian exegesis, the relationship between these words. How distinct are they? How interchangeable are they textual? But I think his, I think his treatment of this is really helpful in terms of the concepts. You can use these as in the conceptual differentiations. That seeks to be one with something. And that can be spiritual, like being one with nature, or it can be being one with a cookie by eating it. Of course, we come to think of eros erotically, right? Being one with somebody by having sex with them. Right? But remember Socrates knew ta erotica, which wasn't just sex. Socrates knew what to care about. This is philia. So this is the love that is satisfied through consummation. Philia, this is the love that seeks cooperation. This is the love in which we experience reciprocity. We love the cookie because we can consume it. We love our friends because we are in reciprocity with them. What kind of love is this? And this is what Jesus claimed was how God loved individuals. This is the love that a parent has for a child. This is not the love of consummation. You're not trying to consume the child. That's evil. And it's not friendship. You're not, like, when you bring a child home from the hospital, and I've done this twice, right? That, that's not your friend. It's not even a person. Now, don't jump on this it's his it's not a functional person now now i know people are going to say right away the abortion thing is going to flood in for some people okay it's not that's not what this conversation is about it this person isn't a functional person but you know should be given the status of person yes but part of the whole debate is the difference between status and functionality and and i love what john is about to say here because it shows the power of love to there was a preacher in Grand Rapids, my preacher Dave Beelan, who always told the story of the Velveteen Rabbit. 
Why? Because the it was the the story of the Velveteen Rabbit is the story of a little girl who has this little rabbit, and and the love of the girl makes the rabbit real, and the love of the parent makes the child real, and and so that's what that's what Verveke is pointing at here. You can't. It's like it's basically a slug. <laughs> but here's the astonishing thing. You you love. It. Not because of any way you can consume it or be one with it. Ew. Ew. You don't love it because, hey, what a you know, great friendship. You love it. And we right? You love it because by loving it, you turn a non person into a person. It's the closest thing to a miracle, and that sounds hackney, I know, but Stop back and think about this. You depend on agape. It's because people loved you before you were a person that you have become the person you are. Love turns non-person animals into moral agent persons. It's like, like, like it's like somehow if I could just care about, right, my sofa enough, it would turn into a Ferrari or something. It's that powerful. And here's what Jesus was offering. That love is, can be made, it can be exacted and made available for all. Here's what is on offer. Here's why Christianity will take the Roman Empire culturally. With agape, Christianity can say to all of the non-persons of the Roman Empire, all the women, all the children, all the non-male citizens, all the sick, all the poor, all the widowed, can take all of those non-persons and say, we will turn you into persons. Same with the babies that were abandoned on the garbage heap. We will turn you into persons. Persons that belong to the kingdom of God. We'll take another look at this in more detail next time. Thank you very much for your time and attention. That's some great stuff. I mean, that's 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 some that's some good preaching. That's some that's some really that's some really awesome stuff he's he's laying down there. And so we're get we'll get into the next one. But I, I wanna I wanna the question is gonna be how does this transformation take place? It takes place via love. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, John three sixteen. Well well can you call upon it? in prayer and and does someone listen this is same harris is god number two um does it care how you relate to it personally does it matter how how you regard it well the transformations and what we talk about transformations and, and how this how this happens that's going to be the subject of the next video i hope so thanks for listening well, a little less than two hours not too bad